you're a kid from Brooklyn, six foot two, lefty, and you're signed by the San Francisco Giants. Just tell us, if you will, what your experience was living so far away from home, pitching for the first time on the West Coast. Give us some thoughts, if you can. 1975, take us back. Well, uh, that year, uh, in spring training, I was invited as a non-roster player, uh, which was like I wasn't on the roster because I was, you know, I was on the 40 man. So they just took me in to make me uh, to see what they had, you know, make me throw and get some experience. And uh, I happened to just things just fell into place. Honestly, uh, at the time, I don't remember what the Giants had in left-handers. There was a few guys there, but I just happened to do very, very well when I was given the opportunity. And uh, I didn't think I'd make the team. I just was happy to be there. I figured by the time spring training ended, I would go to double A or triple A, if, if that, because I, I had played double A the year before for a while. I think I'd go back to Amarillo with the Giants had a team. And I was content with that. I was just happy to be there. And before you know it, spring training is going on. I'm getting a chance to pitch. I'm pitching well. And I'm noticing as time going on, I'm getting more of a chance to pitch. And uh, going, well, let's just see what happens here. And I kept going and going. Before you know it, the pitching coach at the time, uh, his name was Don McMahon. He's a great, great guy. He, matter of fact, he was from Brooklyn, too, originally. He said to me one day, he goes to me, I think we're going to take you with us. And I, I remember getting the chills and going, we need to take me with you. you get, you're on the team. I said, are you serious? Wow. And then I, then I got, like, nervous. And uh, I said, okay. And there was guys there that had more experience than me. And I said, oh, boy. So next thing you know, what, I'm breaking spring training with the San Francisco Giants on the starting rotation at 21 years old. Wow. And uh, it was really, really incredible. It, it was like a – a fantasy thing it was weird. <laughs> you know, you 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 grew up a Yankee fan. You had Bobby Mercer on that team. That had to be a little bit surreal, also. No. Oh yes. As a matter of fact, my roommate in spring training that year was another real non-roster player, Ernie Young, who was a catcher, and both of us were big Bobby Mercer fans. <laughs> and he was he was from Detroit, and I was from Brooklyn. But Bobby Mercer was like, oh my goodness, Bobby Mercer. And I remember seeing Bobby in spring training and getting to know him. And now I am on the same team with him. <laughs> You played your high school ball at Lafayette High School in Brooklyn. And, yeah. you know, a few famous lefties <laughs> came from there. Before you, Sandy Koufax. After you, John Franco. Mm. So you had, you know, you had, quite, you had quite a run there, Lafayette. And just by coincidence, we have a guest in studio later that's going to be coming on talking some football, Ira Liebefarb, and he says, Oh, my God, Pete Falcone was like a, a local legend. We couldn't hit that guy. So he, he knew you from the Brooklyn days. And, um, you know, it, it's amazing to think that a kid coming out of Lafayette High School. But tell us, um, we have a picture of you in your St. Louis Cardinal uniform. We hear that St. Louis is a great baseball town. True? Yeah, yeah. I, I believe it's one of the best baseball towns today. Always was. Tremendous tradition there. Uh, I, I remember playing there. Um, and it was it was just gold to, to be a cardinal. Everybody who was a cardinal was like, a, you know, it's a pride thing, you know, with the, with the, with the uniform, with the uh, the Clydesdales on the on the field before the game at opening day, and uh, all the great cardinal players, Stan Musial being there, and spring training, and it, it was just amazing. Wow. Um, you, you know, didn't have that in San Francisco. You had some. You had some pretty. Uh, talented teammates, Lou Brock, Keith Hernandez, et cetera. So, again, you're in the league, you're getting your feet wet, mm -hmm. and we're going to go over to the next stage of your career. A Brooklyn kid, you get traded to the Mets. We'll go over to our next graphic, and we have a great – you look like you look, need a little bit of a haircut. They got the, you look like DeGrom with the, with the hair the in the back. back. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> pretty good-looking form. And we, got a, we have a, a trading card, Pete, of you. And uh, tell us about that. You get traded – to the Mets? Well, I, I really hit the skids in St. Louis big time. And my last my last year there in 78, I remember going to Puerto Rico to pitch. because I, The 78 season, I was really, really, really down in the dumps there. So they sent me to Puerto Rico that winter to, to pitch. Because I didn't get that many innings that season. I was, I was just in the doghouse. It was just bad, bad time. And uh, it was a really, really confidence issues with me, big time confidence issues. So they sent me to Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, I didn't pitch good. 
And I got released in Puerto Rico. I remember going home with my tail between my legs. And uh, when I got home that winter, I got a phone call that I was traded to the Mets. I said, okay. <laughs> Next thing you know it, uh, I got a call from Joe, Joe Torrey. He sent me down to spring training in 79 season, really about a month early before the whole team to try to get me back. And they put a lot of time into me. And it was really remarkable, I got to say that. But, you know, at the time, the, the Mets back then, we were really in a, on a downswing. Um, we had uh, we lost a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of games, and uh, it was tough. It was tough to pitch there, believe it or not. And uh, we didn't have a great team. I think we finished last place that year. And I think we finished last place every year I was there, probably, probably for the four years I was there. It was a tough time to pitch. But uh, I was home, and there was a lot of pressure. Uh, but you know what? It was the big leagues. You know, I, how can I complain? <laughs> yeah. Well, you had you know you had some Brooklyn ties. You had uh, Lee Mazzilli uh, in center field, Joe Torre. You know, in those years, um, did you like playing for him as a manager? Yeah, Joe. Joe was very low key. Uh, he was he was a guy that he, he wasn't a uh, a micromanager on you. You know, and uh, he didn't have much to work with, honestly. Hmm. And if you look if you look at the division back then, you had Pittsburgh. St. Louis, Philadelphia, Montreal. I mean, those teams were powerhouses back then. And um, I guess we, everybody knew the Mets were not going to finish no higher than fourth or fifth. So he just—he was very patient with everybody. He had a lot of young talent. And uh, but at that times we gelled. At times, most of the time we didn't gel. And uh, we had a lot of good good players come up to the organization when I was there. You know, Mike Scott was it was it, and Jeff Reard and Neil Allen. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good, a lot of good players that came through there, but we just didn't have the, the talent to, to, to compete day in and day out against the National League East back then. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely, uh, it was long seasons, believe it or not. <laughs> hey, hey, Pete, it's Anthony. I, I was thinking, if I remember correctly, you you did uh, uh, kind of double time. You were both a starter and a reliever in your career. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to ask you a question because it's it's one of my pet peeves when. They bring up kids that, that are very promising. I know it's happened twice to the Mets. And uh, let's say if, and if they need help in the bullpen, they put a starter in, in the bullpen. And sometimes it works out, but I know in, in two instances that I'm thinking of, you know, with the Mets, it didn't really uh, work out that well. I, is it a tough adjustment to go from starter to reliever and vice versa? It is tough because when you're a starting pitcher in the major leagues and then they say, well, you can go to the bullpen, it's a downer. It's not. It's not positive, right. and it wasn't really positive for me. And at the time, I was young and I was still naive. I would, I, I didn't take it as a positive thing. Mm. Uh, but the bad thing is when you go to a bullpen, maybe you're the fifth starter or the sixth starter. You lose. You, you lose your spot in the rotation. Next thing you know, it you're a long man in the bullpen. And you know if that means that you're going to pitch if a, if a starter pitcher gets knocked down the second inning, you're going to pitch. And many times, I wouldn't even get a chance to pitch for a week. And then you're in the bullpen, and then when you get a chance to pitch, being that you're not really in rhythm, right. you Different. press. You pre and I did a lot of pressing, trying to reestablish myself. And uh, a lot of times, we, we dig the hole deeper for ourselves, you know? And I, I definitely did that. I definitely did that. You know, uh, Pete, we're going to get back to uh, baseball in a minute because there's plenty more to uh, talk about. But... If we can, we're going to go over to our next graphic, uh, G7. And your cousin, uh, Phil Falcone, was on our last episode. And um, yeah. he was our special guest on the last episode. We'll go over to our next graphic when we can. And he was a director and producer of an independent film that he filmed on Staten Island. And it was called Joe's War. And we were so taken back. I mean, there's the, the, uh, there's the uh, poster to the movie. And it's a story about a, a young uh, veteran that comes back uh, to Staten Island after um, being in Afghanistan and struggling to uh, assimilate back into society. And um, it, was, it was a riveting interview, and we put uh, a clip on YouTube, and we received hundreds and hundreds of emails to the show from uh, retired veterans struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. So we really want to give you, your whole family, you know, a round of applause because <laughs> it, it was 
quite impactful, and he had uh, Armand Asante is in the movie, Ed Asner, so I'm sure you're very proud of him also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Philip, Philip I'm, I'm not even sure I've had much experience in that. And uh, my son, Joey, who, who plays baseball at Columbia, he helped out in that movie. Mm. Uh, Joey was, is, my son, Joey, is, is a, a combat veteran with the, with the 3rd Marines, and he was a Navy corpsman, and he had three tours, combat tours. So Joey kind of gave him some insight on what, it's, what it was really like for guys, you know? Wow. So that was really helpful for Philip. You, what we'll do is, because you, you touched on it, so we'll go over to our next uh, graphic. And uh, just as you said, your son, three tours in the Marines, and that's from the NCAA. They're promoting him, and he's got him with his... Uh, left-handed power swing with mm. the Columbia uniform, as you said. And the caption is, the education of Joey Falcone. The once yeah, struggling yeah. student used the military as a launching pad to the Ivy League and college baseball. And Absolutely. Wow, I mean, again, something to be yeah, so proud, proud of. Oh, I'm so I, proud of that kid. It, it, it brings tears to my eyes, you know? Uh, Knowing what he went through when he came back home, uh, he came to Louisiana to see us, and I could tell he was just—he wasn't the same kid. And uh, he wanted to play baseball in college, and we tried. And we sent letters, and he finally found a way to play. He played for the College of Staten Island his, his freshman year and lived there. And uh, then he found himself on uh, the, the Columbia team as a walk-on, and he spent three seasons there. Uh, and being being on, a, on, on college baseball teams, it really helped him come out of himself and put, put all that PTSD away from him, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'm grateful to uh, the coaches at uh, Columbia for uh, giving him a chance to, to walk on and play. I really am. And he really helped the team, especially this year. They, they won the Ivy League yesterday, and Joey had two home runs in the, first, in the, in the final game. It was amazing. Nice five all the eyes. <laughs> you know... As we filmed, yesterday was Mother's Day, so that was a nice Mother's Day gift okay. that he gave uh, his mom. And as you said, uh, Columbia won the Ivy League championship, and your son, he led the Ivy League in RBIs with 48. He led uh, home runs, batting average, doubles, everything. And what you shared um, uh, yesterday, because I was speaking to you over the phone, he did this all. He was just coming back. Uh, he had a, a pulled oblique, no less. Wow. Yeah, he called me last week and told me that. And when he, when he told me that, I said, oh, no, because I did that one time in Atlanta. I pulled that little oblique muscle, and I couldn't do anything for three weeks. Uh, they probably should have put me on the DL, but I, I was useless. And I said to him, how bad is it? And he told me it hurt him, but I could tell that it wasn't near as bad as what I had. it. So they, they wrapped him pretty tight uh, over the weekend, and he said he felt great. Um, so it didn't hurt him. And by no means did it hurt him. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go over to our next graphic, Pete. It had to be very touching and meaningful to you. We're going to go over to uh, G8. And it was on Memorial Day at City Field 2013. Your son throws out the first pitch. They call you out also, and the Met fans give you a standing ovation. Yeah, yeah that was insane. That was amazing. I never got a standing ovation as a player for the Mets. <laughs> but uh, it would do. to walk out there and see him throw the first ball out, and uh, the catcher came to, came to the mound, gave him the ball, and he just gave him, he just gave him a great um, you know, encouragement and thanked him for his service. And we shook hands, and uh, we walked up the field and watched the game. They put us in the suite upstairs, and we had great food. and It was just a remarkable time, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable time. 